Hello! Welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about the basics of population dynamics. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. To have an overview um, for this particular uh, lesson, I recommend that you watch this video entitled Population's Biotic Potential. I'll provide the link in the description below. So, biotic potential and environmental resistance are two major forces that help maintain balance in an ecosystem. So, we define biotic potential as the population's capacity for growth, usually represented by R max, wherein R refers to the intrinsic rate of increase or uh, the rate of population growth with unlimited resources. Okay? So, assuming that there is unlimited food, water, enough space, um, um, uh, good temperature or conducive temperature, everything that an organism would need um, or a, a community would need, um, what is their rate of reproduction? How fast will they be, uh, will they, uh, how fast will they reproduce? So that's biotic potential, okay? So our max, um, what's the capacity? How, how big can that population grow um, with unlimited resources, okay? So, biotic potential is the maximum growth rate, okay? We've talked about that. Um, it depends on a number, it, it depends on the following, no? the number of offspring, um, their, their average survival rate, for example, um, how many of the offspring will survive, how early and how often reproduction takes place, okay? Now, please note that uh, biotic potential is hard to measure outside, uh, hard to measure outside the lab. Okay, so it's it's hard to actually set the parameters in order to study this in the actual environmental setup. So most of the time, um, scientists try to simulate uh, biotic potential in the laboratory, or they actually go and observe organisms in the wild. But of course, they have to include all the limitations of their study. Now, one important thing that's connected to biotic potential are the different reproductive strategies that animals, uh, that plants and animals and organisms have in order to increase the possibility and the probability of their offspring to survive into adulthood. And we'll talk more about um, reproductive strategies as we go along. Okay, so again, reproductive strategies, they ensure that birds okay, will exceed deaths Okay, so it, it ensures that there's, there will be a high survival rate of the offspring. Um, so that's just an overview. Now, environmental resistance is the other force that maintains balance that maintains balance in an ecosystem. So environmental resistance are factors that limit the population. So these counter counters biotic potential. So biotic potential increase increase in population environmental resistance it limits the population growth okay so these are called limiting factors okay they and they are determined by the carrying capacity of the ecosystem so how many population how how big of a population for example how many how many lions can can this um uh ecosystem sustain Okay, wherein all of them will survive. So that's carrying capacity. How many leopards? How many, for example, how many frogs? How many snakes? How, what's the population of a species that, that this ecosystem can sustain? So that's carrying capacity. So um, as what I've mentioned, no, all of these um, concepts are quite hard to, to, um, to, to specify and to determine in the wild because there's a lot of factors to consider. So, however, um, environmentalists, ecologists, biologists, scientists are still learning more and more about these factors that shape the ecosystem, right? So, um, so uh, biotic potential assumes that there's unlimited resources, but that's not the case. No population can grow indefinitely or unlimited because there's always limitations in resources, okay? There's no such thing as unlimited resor resources. There's always limitations or limited resources. So organisms will compete for light, water, nutrients, uh, food. Um, uh, they will also compete with each other for the right to mate with their female and the territories and so on and so forth. 
So whenever we talk about population dynamics, we also have to be familiar with the different factors that affect uh, that affect it, okay? Such as de population density, population dispersion, and age structure of the population. So let's look at them one by one. So the first one is population density. This refers to the number of individuals of a population that live or inhabit a particular region or land or water area, okay? So how many people are there in that area? Okay? What's their population? Uh, so this is a, wor a world map showing us the population density of humans as of 2019. So the uh, those countries with uh, below 50 humans per square mile are the following. Okay, so there's very few people given in given a square mile. So countries like Australia, you have Russia here, Mongolia, some parts of Africa here, uh, Greenland, Canada, um, Argentina, Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken, and is this Parag uh, Uruguay? Paraguay, I, I, I have forgotten. So these countries, the, uh, New Zealand, these countries have few people per square mile. Per square mile okay? So there's only 50 per square mile. The next would be 50 to 100 and then 100 to 250 people or humans per square mile. So that's the following countries. So you have United States, Alaska, Brazil, some, some countries here in Africa. I, I'm not familiar um so okay so some parts of europe also here they have very few people per square mile but to uh, this color light blue 200 to 500 people per square mile so that's um china here um indonesia malaysia what else um again some parts of uh europe i'm not i'm not sure i think uh, um no this is italy i think so some parts of Europe, perhaps Sweden, Denmark, and all that. Then this is where the Philippines um, falls, okay? 500 to 1,000 people per square mile, okay? So the Philippines is one of that. Uh, we have this much number of people in our given um, land, okay? So that's quite too many people in a very small area. So Philippines have that, um, Japan, South, South Korea, Vietnam, um, Pakistan, I think, Nepal, yeah, this is Germany, Italy, United Kingdom, uh, and others. Okay. I think this is Puerto Rico. And then, um, color violet, 1,000 to 5,000 humans per square mile. So you have here very prominent India, and then, um, is this Taiwan? I, I think this is Taiwan, or, or uh, this is North Korea, then this is South Korea, color violet. South Korea, and then this is Taiwan, if I'm not mistaken, okay? And then, we cannot see it here, but there are some parts of the globe where they have 5,000 to 10,000 people per square mile, and then 10,000 and above per square mile. So, it shows us, this map shows us how dense each country is, okay? In the Philippines, we are halfway there. We have so we have many people or many humans given our small, popul uh, small region, okay? Small area, small small land okay? while well, the others they have um, quite a big area to support their population so the next uh, concept is population dispersion this tells us how individuals of a population are spaced how are they distributed within a region okay so let's see here so these are the three major types of uh, population dispersion so again it shows us the spatial relationship between members of a population within a habitat. So we have clumping dispersion. So here, the organisms, the population, tend to flock together. Okay? So this is the most common pattern of population. They flock together. Uniform distribution, uh, dispersion, they are uniformly spaced out or uniformly distributed throughout. The, there's an equal number of uh, space between each individual. Um, they are equally spaced all throughout the region. And then random dispersion, they do not follow um, any, any pattern. They, are, they, just, they just grow wherever it is possible or they just, um, they just settle on areas wherein it's possible for them to survive. So let's look at examples. 
Okay, so here, uniform pattern, okay, um, uh, for example, territorial birds such as penguin, they tend to have a uniform distribution. They tend to um, uh, keep a safe distance from each other so that they will have this area for them to feed. Okay, so same with um, other other arboreal uh, birds or or birds that live on, on top of trees. They they build their nests quite far from each other so that their future offspring will have um, enough area to fly around and catch their prey. Random dispersion, there's no pattern. The, just where, where the wind blows, the spores or the seeds, that's where plants would grow. So, example, you have your dandelions, right? They are this, there's no pattern. They are distributed wherever. They are distributed randomly. Then clumped, okay, such as elephants here. These are usually shown by herd animals, right? They travel in groups. They travel in clumped um, dispersion. This ensures that the weakest and the oldest are usually protected by the herd okay, or by the, by, by the family of organisms. Other examples here, so yun clumped dispersion shown here by elephants. They tend to herd together. A uniform such as they, they, there's an equal space between the organism such as this creosote uh, bush. So they are equally spaced so that the roots will be able to, to get equal number of nutrients and water from the soil. Then random wherever the wind blows, such as your dandelions, so spore, firm, spore reproducing or spore forming um, fungi also reproduce, are, are also dispersed in this manner. So the last one is age structure. So this actually groups the population into three. Uh, based on their reproductive status. So we have the first stage, the, those um, members of the population who fall under pre-reproductive stage. So they are the ones who cannot reproduce yet. So these are the children, the babies, the young ones. The reproductive stage, these are the uh, members of the population that can reproduce already. So that's uh, young adults already. And then post-reproductive stage, these are the groups of people in the population who cannot reproduce anymore. So these are the elderly um, postmenopausal um, females who cannot reproduce anymore. So let's revisit uh, the interaction of biotic potential and environmental resistance and how they affect the population size. So I've mentioned that these two factors, biotic potential and environmental resistance, are important in maintaining balance of um, a population size. So let's review. So again, biotic potential um, is the rate um, by which the population grows, assuming that there's unlimited resources. Um, as long as there's food, water, shelter, everything that they need to survive, the population will continuously increase. Okay. So what are examples of those um, growth factors or biotic potential? Um, um, biotic potential. So you have favorable light for favorable temperature, favorable and anything, everything that's favorable. Um, so that in, that contributes to the population growth. So that's for abiotic factors. For biotic factors, so those are the high reproductive rate. It means that there's very high success in 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 mating, in breeding, um, adequate food supply, generalized niche. It, it means that they have a specific role and in in a, in, an, in their food web, in their food chain. So for example, if they are predators, they're effective predators. If they're producers, they're effective producers. Okay, ability to compete, okay, the ability to hide or, or defend against predators. Ability to resist diseases and parasites. So they can fight off diseases. So that increases the, the population growth. Ability to migrate and live in other habitats. Okay? And ability to adapt to environmental change. All of these growth factors okay, increase the population. So you can see here from zero... So, for example, to 180, I'm not sure, let's just give a number, to, to 5,000, okay? It pushes the, the, the population size towards the positive side, so it increases the population. However, that cannot, um, that cannot remain for long because sooner or later, the population will encounter environmental resistance. So, again, these are the factors that decrease the population. Because there is really no such thing as unlimited resources. Eventually, water will run out, food will run out, mates will run out, um, 
um, shelter will run out and that will that will cause a decrease in population so environmental resistance as the name implies it is the environment resisting the population growth so what are those in terms of abiotics so here if there's favorable favorable light and temperature so here there's too much or too little light not enough light too high or too low temperature not favorable temperature unfavorable chemical environment so all of this will eventually decrease the population okay so if there's too much plants uh, competing for light or sunlight eventually some plants will have too little light so they cannot perform photosynthesis then they will die okay so in terms of biotic um re biotic factors so low reproductive rate so not very successful reproduction or mating or breeding uh, unsuitable or destroyed habitat if if their natural environment got destroyed through a fire um, um, a hurricane or typhoon or an earthquake okay inability to resist diseases and parasites okay so if they get, if a portion of the population gets sick so that's environmental resistant resistance acting on the population then they eventually die for example if there's too many people there's not enough food not everyone can eat those people will die okay or there's too many uh there's too many people it's very it's quite easy for diseases to be passed around just like what's happening right now with covid 19 so some people cannot uh resist the the disease so they eventually die okay um inability to migrate or live off in ha other habitats okay and inability to adapt to environmental change okay so this limits the population these are limiting factors that ensures that the population will not grow too big so again ha, biotic potential pushes for population growth assuming that there's unlimited resources but there's no such thing as unlimited resources eventually they will meet environmental resistance and this will push back the population um, back to a balanced number now if you're going to ask me this is what i often tell my students there's no good or bad here um, growth factors are not good because they, they increase the population eventually um, if there's too many too many organisms too many individuals too many insects too many lions too many um, too many predators too many uh, plants eventually it will it will also lead to the death of some organisms so biotic potential are not always good and environmental resistance are not always bad what's good is balance in population that, that's the aim that's the goal to have a balanced population so we, 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 we should not think that oh diseases are bad i mean that's why we have levels of organization if you look at it at organism level of course of course death and disease and diseases and death are, are devastating for for that person for that individual but if you look at it at ecosystem level that's not surprising eventually it will actually the population will actually experience environmental resistance because they have too much population again when there's too much population if it's continuously grow it will meet environmental resistance so at one air at one point um plagues okay plagues and pandemics and diseases are, are devastating they take lives they kill if you look at it at organism level but if you look at it at ecosystem level it's actually not not surprising because population growth will eventually meet environmental resistance so such as diseases or, or inability of organisms to to resist diseases so again growth factors biotic potential this is not the that the hero of the ecosystem and then environmental resistance this is not the villain of the ecosystem there's no good or bad here what we want is balance this is what we aim for this is the good this is the good part okay this is the good the good part of the population a balanced ecosystem a balanced population size so um to learn more about why why animals have different lifespans i recommend that you watch this ted ed video this is actually not a recommendation but a requirement and this will actually open your mind and open your your um, answer your, your curiosity as to why we have varying uh, lifespans among organisms so i'll provide the link in the description below um why i recommend it is that it will shock you that humans really do not have 
such a long lifespan when compared to other animals and organisms. Okay? But again, we have um, special circumstance. Okay? But so that's why you, you are required to watch this video. So I thought this is another way to see a population pyramid. So I've mentioned that males are found on left side, females on right side, and then they're categorized based on pre-reproductive stage, so ages 0 to 14, reproductive stage 15 to 44, Okay, and then post-reproductive stage 45 and above. So in countries such as Guatemala, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia, it, since they have more, more children than adults and old, um, older people, they are said to have countries undergoing rapid growth. Because this will be promoted here, and then this will go here, and then eventually they will, they will get older. So the country is uh, increasing in population. But what, uh, how, uh, for countries such as United States, Australia, and Canada, as you can see, they have quite a few, just a few number of children. So more or less, they tend to follow replacement level fertility. These, these um, 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 adults are just having enough children to replace them. So it's almost equal as you can see. To replace them in their population, so they tend to have slow growth. Zero growth, okay, so this one, they have totally followed replacement level fertility. So countries like Spain, Austria, and Greece, they have limitation. They just have a limited number of children. So these are the number of adults. They just have this number of children. So they just have two, okay? So they compared to a zero growth, uh, to slow growth, zero growth, as you can see, there's no, no increase in the number of children. Well, countries such as Germany, Bulgaria, and Sweden, they have a negative growth. There are more adults and more older people than there are children. Okay? I think countries like Japan also have this um, problem. They have more, more older people than adults and then than children. Okay? Um, this is quite, this is problematic because, of course, the population is growing. We have to feed all of them, educate all of them. But at the same time, this is also problematic in such a way that there are more people who are, who are enjoying pension. It means that they are receiving money, but they are no longer part of the workforce. They are no longer contributing to the labor force of that country, but yet the country has to pay them. And who will replace them if, they, if the children's generation are fewer? So that's also a thing to consider. So how about the Philippines? Where do you think we fall under? Are we rapid growth or slow growth, zero or negative growth? Um, so this is the population pyramid of the Philippines um, for 20 years. So 2000, 2010, and 2020. So what do you know? What do you notice? So in 2010, we we can we can be described as a country having rapid growth. Okay, we have more children, more uh, population in the pre-reproductive stage and then fewer here in the uh, post-reproductive stage. But just after a span of 10 years, we see a decrease in a decrease in the number of children adults are having. Okay? So there's this decrease. Okay? So from, the, from for, for example, instead of having three children, women, uh, uh, couples are only having two children. More and more couples are having two children. Okay, so even if there's a population growth, the, the, the distribution of the population changed. So as you can see here, we have more older people than 10, year, than 10 years ago. Now 2020, so this is our population pyramid. You can see here this drastic decrease in population. Okay, so this is around ages 0 to 4. Something happened here, okay, in this, in this time, okay? that there's this decrease in the number of children that adults um, were having, okay? So we are slowly going to, going towards slow growth and going to zero growth, okay? So from rapid growth in 2000, then slow growth, now we are going towards uh, zero growth, just a span of 20 years. So these are just some of the many human impacts on ecosystems, okay? pollution, habitat degradation and fragmentation, 
ecosystem simplification, genetic resistance, predator elimination, introduction of non-native species, over-harvesting renewable resources, and interference with ecological systems. So I will be recommending um, a lot of videos for you to watch that will emphasize how human activities greatly and negatively impact a balanced ecosystem. So this one is the threat of invasive species from TED Ed. I'll provide the link in the description below. This one is how activi human, human activities that threaten biodiversity. Okay, so I'll provide the link in the description below. Kindly watch all these videos, very, very important. And I also recommend that you visit this page in the online library entitled Ecological Problems. So that is where all of this will be thoroughly discussed okay, by the reports of my previous students. So you can access all that. They also have um, infographics, they have videos, they have news articles. So you can access all of those. Um, I'll provide the link in the description below. So the best way for us to see how big of a of how big uh, human impacts are in the environment is to just observe our ecological footprint. So we define ecological footprint as the measurement of a population's demand uh, for the ecosystem just to just to supply their resources that they need and the services that they acquire. So for this is um, a visualization of a carbon uh, ecological footprint. Okay, we're in to, just to supply the needs of this community. They need this big uh, fishing ground. They need this area for cropland. They need this area for grazing of animals, uh, for slaughter. Um, they also uh, use the resources from the forest um, and then also yun, remaining forest lands. So according to United Nations Environmental Program, we define ecological footprint as, again, the measure of area, okay, um, productive land and water that a population uses with current technology to generate the resources it consumes, okay? As well as the as well as uh, what's needed to absorb its waste. So ecological footprint is what we take from the environment just to sustain our um, survival, our even our lifestyle. Okay. Uh, I also recommend that you visit this global footprint network, this website, wherein they will discuss everything about ecological footprint. I'll provide the link in the description below. Also, this video from National Geographic Channel, Human Footprint, um, um, more vis visualization on the different um, uh, ways by which we harvest uh, resources from um, the environment. So again, the link in the description below. So that ends our video. I hope you learned something new today. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Till next time, goodbye.